The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Tell Life Limited, ABN 7005 0109 450, AFSL 2378 48, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. My name is Sasha Lutkovsky and I'm a former insurance advisor of 15 years and CEO of The Sale Agency, a firm dedicated to helping advisors grow their businesses. This series is all about insurance, exploring the start to end process of putting a policy in place all the way through to claim time. I'm joined by five experts who share their knowledge and insights and a few stories along the way. So let's get started. This podcast series is brought to you by leading Australian life insurer, TAL. TAL is committed to partnering with advisors to protect the financial well-being of their clients, now and into the future. TAL's accelerated protection products ensure your clients have access to cover options that are suited to their individual needs. Last financial year, TAL paid $3.5 billion in claims to over 45,000 customers. Persons deciding whether to acquire or continue to hold life insurance issued by TAL should consider the relevant product disclosure statement. The target market determination for the product is also available online at tal.com.au. Welcome to episode four in our series focusing on all things insurance. I'm joined by Glenn Baird, head of mental health at TAL, to talk about mental health in the workplace, how advisors can manage their mental health, and of course, how we can help our clients in the event of a claim or other stressful experiences. Glenn, welcome. Thank you. So, Glenn, head of mental health at an insurer must be quite the undertaking. Tell us a bit about how you got here. Yeah, it's a great question, Sasha. I, uh, if you had said to me, well, I've been at Tal now for six years uh, next month. Uh, if you had said to me six years ago, actually seven years ago, you're going to go to an insurer, there's no way in the world it was on my radar. So prior to, prior to being here at Tal, I was working for a suicide prevention service and I was there for 14 years and, uh, and, and working day to day with suicidal clients, you, you learn a lot about people and it got to the point where I was, I was needing a break and I thought I, I need to get away from the counseling for a while because I was, there was probably a bit of burnout, uh, not probably, there was a bit of burnout and setting in pretty fast. And then I thought, you know what, I'll take it to, I'll take a corporate gig for a couple of years and I'll go back to counseling. And, um, and that was my, my intent back in 2017. Um, and I just, I saw this on, on seek and, uh, and I just thought, yeah, I'll throw my hat in the ring for that one. And yes, uh, I was here kind of within six months and I knew that I didn't want to go back to counseling. Um, so that whole two year, um, goal initially was, was thrown out the window and, um, yeah, and six years on, and really enjoying being at Tal and and the the uh, the role that that I have here, and uh, you know I think it's exciting for me because when we do this stuff right at a at a big insurer like Tal, you know we have big reach, and and therefore when we do it right, we're going to have big impact, and and that really excites me. And supporting um, our partners in doing that, specifically our financial advisors in supporting their clients, you know that's um. There's there's a feel good that comes along with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've mentioned a couple of really interesting points that I'm going to come back to. Yeah, <laughs> One yeah. thing I do want to know, and I'm sure our listeners do as well, is is what does the head of mental health do? What what does a day to day look like for you? What, how how do you support you know, your your clients being Tal uh, and yeah. also Tal's customers? What does that look like? Yeah, that's a good question, Sasha. Um, the role is quite broad that I have here at Tal. Uh, there is obviously a lot of training that I do for you know supporting our claims and underwriting teams and our, and our contact center teams with helping understand mental health conditions, uh, how to have conversations with those that are grieving, uh, supporting people that might be disclosing issues around um, you know self harm and suicide. There's and supporting them with understanding those conditions, but also how to have the right conversations with the people in those in those times of need. 
Um, there's supporting our product teams with with language and, and how we um, how we describe certain uh, when we, how we describe mental health in our products. Uh, and there's prevention programs. Um, and you know, instead of just waiting for uh, people to come on claim and then supporting them, which is absolute bread and butter and it's so important of, of the work that we do. But there, I think there's more we can do in a prevention lens and try and keep people well for longer. And I think, um, so my role as head of mental health, it sits in the broader health services team. So uh, what I love about how, where I sit, it's a broad look at health. Um, so, you know, I'm sitting with with uh, medical officers and they're, they're all doctors, uh, forensic accountants, and we're looking at the, you know, the physical, mental and financial health of, of each person. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's kind of our, our guide. It's thinking about the whole person, not just a diagnosis of depression, for example, um, or not just the, um, the the physical health condition that they might have. How does that impact their mental health? So we, we're kind of intertwined with, with with our thinking at kind of every step of the of the the journey that that person might have with Tal. And I think that's that's a really important lens that 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 you look through and that you've raised as a point because you know one of the things that advisors and and financial professionals are starting to have to really take into account is how mental health is interlinked with physical and with financial health. And we're seeing not just for our clients, but for advisors and and financial advice professionals as well, the current, I'm going to call it current economic climate, but the current social climate we find ourselves in, how how is is mental health playing out in where we find ourselves now? and, And how do you see it changing, evolving, or, or not changing or evolving going forward? It's really interesting. I, I think about what COVID has done for the way we talk about mental health, and there's obviously a lot more people talking about it, which is fantastic. And and, and I think this is where we need it to be uh, when it comes to the narrative of, of that. Um, you know, do I, I think there might be more people going to be experiencing mental health conditions in the future. You know, that's kind of where the trajectory is going. Um, it, we certainly have seen that at our claim at claim time at Tal. You know, claims related to mental health are now our number one cause of claim, and at, I think at nineteen percent of claims. Um, so yeah, look, it's um, when we think about it, yeah, it, it's something that we need to be thinking holistically about. And and when we think about the economic climate, um, financial pressure and the way it impacts a person's mental state, their mental health, you know, it's it can't be understated. And I think we see that. We see that at claim time when a person is on claim and they're on, you know, uh, 75% of their income, already that puts a financial pressure on. And you add that to the economic climate that we're in when someone's already lost 25% of their income because of a physical or mental health condition that's caused them to come on claim, uh, you know, that puts a whole lot of pressure on, on, on not only the individual, but then... Um, if they're the, the main breadwinner for the family, it not only puts pressure on uh, them financially, then on their mental state because of the financial pressure, but then the family pressure that comes from that as well. You know, it's it's a really tricky spot for, for a person to be on claim. And I hear a lot about, you know, uh, vulnerable customers and um, who's vulnerable, who's more vulnerable. And I think anyone that comes on a claim would tell is we should be looking at as a vulnerable customer because of the pressure that um, that they'd be under physically, mentally, financially. We have to consider those um, in its entirety. Yeah, and it's interesting. Just coming back to your earlier point about mental health claims now making up, you know, nineteen percent of of yeah. claims experiences. You know, and then I don't know whether that refers to just the primary cause of claim, but you know, in my advice practice, the amount of times that we'd have mental health as a secondary condition as a result Absolutely. of not always a physical condition, but like cancer, all that type of stuff, the client can um, recover from those events, but then still be on claim for a, a mental health condition as a result. So it's 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 really quite an issue for clients. And then we talk about these vulnerable customers and, and the financial pressure and all of that can't be understated. So prevention programs are a large part of, of what you, know, you're, you do, what you develop. So how can advisors work to take preventative measures for their clients and and where's the line for a business do you think in doing that because how much onus is on an advisor to you know do preventative type work as opposed to reactive type work when a client goes on claim 
Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question, and and I think that's um that's part of the the offering for it. In my layman's terms, I guess uh, it's it's part of the offering that an advisor could you know strengthen their their relationship with their with their clients. For me, I don't think it's necessary necessarily their responsibility um, to be pushing that. But I think there's there's an opportunity for them to be almost like that support person, that uh, that champion on the side. You know, if I think about my financial advisor, um, I don't think he's just looking out for my financial best interests of you know me into retirement. He's looking out for me uh, and me as a person. And so you know, when I share with him things and some health challenges that I've had, you know, he's he's a strong supporter and he's an ally next to me. And and I and I think. Um, whilst I'm a health professional and I know the, the things I need to do, he's never really championing me to do more prevention work. But I don't see, you know, I wouldn't be offended if he did, if he was encouraging me to do more around my physical or mental health. You know, he's, and he's certainly trying to help me with my financial health. Yeah, so I don't think it's the responsibility of an, of an advisor, but I think if there's an opportunity to promote good health pre- health prevention programs, I just think it's, it's a value add to the the service offering to to an advisor's uh, clients. Hmm. That's it's it's. I wouldn't say it's a fine line, but it is definitely an opportunity for advisors. Mm. And it doesn't have to be something massive. It doesn't have to be a full program. But you're right to be that support person. I think is embedded in the claims process. If you're an advisor who's handling a claim for a client, I dare say it is it, it is really part of the process. Okay, so we've been talking about, you know, clients being on claim, how mental health claims make up such a large portion of claims, and also, you know, mm. what advisors can do to help clients uh, on claim. So what support is out there for advisors to do that, if any? Yeah, look, I, I think there's, um, there's, look, if you jump on, there's plenty of websites out there that, um, you know, if we think about Black Dog Institute, Beyond Blue, Sane Australia, they, they can give uh, plenty of information around mental health conditions themselves. One thing that we offer at TAL, and I'm sure some other insurers do similar things, but what we offer at TAL through the TAL Risk Academy uh, is a number of uh, different sessions to try and equip advisors to have the the tricky conversations. Uh, we know from the the value of advice research that we we looked at, um, it, just over forty percent of advisors somewhat avoided the conversations, the tricky conversations about when people are on claim, especially when it comes to grief and bereavement. Um, so that's one topic that we've tried to target through the Risk Academy is to is to support advisors on on what to say and what not to say to um, to a person that might be grieving. For example, there's the the session on there around. Um, uh, that we do each year around AUAK Day, around talking to someone that may be at risk of suicide. Um, you know, they're tricky conversations to have and and you know, not a lot of people, even health professionals, don't have the confidence to have the right conversation in that space. So it's equipping advisors with, you know, they're two uh, topics for as, as an example. It's equipping advisors with the skills to be able to have those conversations um, because, you know, that's a... That's a huge value add to to an advisor's business if they're ha- able to have those those right conversations at the right time uh, and know that you know the it's not just about again the, the the my financial health or my retirement fund or those kind of things. It's about me as a person and making sure my welfare is okay. And having an advisor that knows how to listen and knows what to say and what not to say to me that's a huge opportunity for uh, for advisors. That's the information for to specifically to support advisors um, and the conversations they have. But then there's also the the tools that each insurer has. Um, um, one that we have at Tal is uh, is Headlight. It's a screening tool just to help help clients uh, have a quick snapshot of their of their mental state and provides them a risk category of of what their the risk is for um, for poor mental health, uh, low risk, medium risk, high risk, and then there's referral pathways from there. Uh, and, and so there's that and some other tools that are available for advisors to pass on to their um, their clients just to support them. Hopefully, if we're helping educate and upskill advisors having the right conversations and providing the right tools that they can pass on to clients to take up themselves, hopefully we're starting to get a shift in the right direction and, and bring more awareness um, to mental health, which is 
always needed, but also some tangible um, processes and pathways, I guess, to, to get them to the right help that they need at the right time. Yeah, absolutely fabulous. Now, it's really good that those tools exist in in you know in a wider marketplace for advisors to to um, help clients. I guess that leads on to my next question, which is, well, how can advisors help themselves? So I guess a couple of lead-ins there is that, you know, we've heard from the ensemble community, um, you know, advisors and advice professionals giving us their feedback. You know, someone was quoted as saying, you know, this experience with my client knocked me for six. Um, you know, there's a lot of financial and 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 educational and just marketplace pressure on advisors. We all know from all of the reforms and all that sort of thing. We've got advisors, some of whom are quoted as feeling bleak, you know, in 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 their future prospects. I myself, my very first claim was actually my very first clients. They'd been clients for three or uh, three or four months, and then went on claim. You know, four months after the policy was in force, unfortunately. The husband of that family um, passed away very suddenly at 36 years old. And, you know, I'd been advising for four months. You know, I didn't quite know what to do with that, with that, all those feelings. So how can advisors help themselves in this space? It's so important. And this is something that I do. I talk about a lot with advisors at PD days and conferences. It's so important that where we have advisors looking out for for themselves, um, some of the conversations that they'd be having with with customers that need to make a claim, they're tricky conversations to have, and they're they're exhausting, they're, they're stressful, uh, and it's certainly when our when when advisors clients might be disgruntled or upset, um, you know they they have to wear some of that. Um, so look, it, it's it's a huge part of I think of their role as maintaining their own mental state. I'm I'm a firm believer that it's. Uh, I love the five ways to well-being. That that's a um, that's some research that was produced out of the New Economic Foundation out of the UK. And you know the five ways to well-being. You know it's it's about want to remain active um, as much as possible. Uh, continue learning is you know kind of tip number two. Uh, staying socially connected is so important for an advisor. Um, that would for everyone. And but I think an advisor and an, an advisor community. I think it's good that they, if if there's some social connections and camaraderie across advisors or, or, or different groups, give back to others. Uh, I think is a really important one. Um, and I think there's some there's something that advi- an advisor might get that anyway from the work they do because you know setting someone up for um, for for their future is, is giving back. But there's there can be other ways to give back. And then the last one is kind of being aware or taking notice, being mindful, um, and it's finding activities where they have the moments to be um, to kind of stop and pause and uh, and not be kind of juggling multiple things at once. So you know those kind of five tips, I love them. I I, I heavily promote them because they're simple, they're practical, and it's um, anyone can do them. And it's not like you need to be great at every single one, but as long as you're working towards or trying to improve on those five areas, I think that goes a long way to to help an advisor improve uh, their own mental state. Um, because, you know, we, it's tricky. It's, it's, a, it, it's a stressful job. And I, I've, um, I've spoken to a lot of advisors and, um, and the busyness, the pressure that they're under, um, it's always, oh, I'm not sure I can find the time for that. And I, and I think it's almost... You'll never find the time. You have to make the time to 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 focus on some of those little things that we know make a difference. And I often have an analogy back to basketball. Um, the like we all those five tips for well being. We all know those things. We know we need to be more active. We know we need to stay socially connected and maybe give back to other people and and continue learning. We know that stuff, but it's uh it's just something we we often forget about. Uh, oh yeah, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. And I remember, you know, I think about the amount of times as I used to be a professional basketball player and the amount of times we would learn to, like a defensive stance. You know, you're standing in defensive stance and, and it's painful. No one likes being in their defensive stance. It hurts and, you know, you do it over and over. And even though you know it, your coaches do it for year on year and you think, oh, man, really? We're working on my defensive stance. But it's so important that you do that because when it comes time to like the fourth quarter, when you're tired, you're stressed, you're fatigued, you're distracted, the crowd's really, really noisy, you need to be able to go back to the fundamentals. And, and I think that's there's an element in that for, for an advisor 
when it's noisy, they're fatigued, they're distracted, they've got you know, families to run, businesses to run, uh, all these distractions, they've got to remember to come back to the fundamentals. And, and I think those five tips for well-being are a good place to do that. That's a really good resource, a simple set of tips. Like you said, we know them. We all we know we should all be being more active. We should all be engaging with these things. And it is a matter of making the time. And I think any advice professional, regardless of where you're working in advice, it's just always on. We often take work home with us. We also take our clients' concerns and issues and fears and hopes and dreams home with us as well. It is a, a, a profession that I think puts a lot of burden but not in a bad way, but that sort of burden mm. on advisors. Mm. So, you know, th- there's there's this epidemic of, of burnout happening at the moment. I guess one of my questions is, is, is that you yourself working in the medical field, working in mental health, how do you stay healthy uh, given that you work in, a, in an area that can have high burnout, especially if we've seen off the back of COVID and things like that. Obviously, mm. we've talked about the five ways to well-being, but is there anything above and beyond that, that that you do in your life to make sure you look after yourself? Yeah, I uh, I've always been a pretty good talker. You know, I've never I've never shied away from my friends and my family telling them exactly where I'm at, um, and that's. Uh, but it kind of goes against the grain of my family because my family's very much, you know, just just do it, suck it up, and deal with it. Um, whereas I've, I've, I think I'm helping influence my own family and being able to do and talk about it more. So, talking is one. I'm, I'm always uh, my social connections are important to me, and I and they're important that to me because I feel as I can share with them exactly where I'm at. So that's a big one for me is 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 connecting in with mates, um, but also activity. I um, I try to do as much as I can. Um, I try to, you know, row most mornings uh, just a, on the a stationary rower. But I do that for multiple reasons. I, I want to stay fit. But you know, my boys are twelve and, and nine years old, and you know, they, as a former basketball player, they love their basketball, and all they want to do is play me in one on one. And there's a pride element in me. I just I have to keep beating them for as long as I can. <laughs> so that, that's why I need to stay fit. So they don't beat me when I'm, you know, uh, when they're 13 years old. So, but it's it's also it's running around with them and staying fit with them. Um, that that's a big driver for me. So it'd definitely be the activity and the social connections. I do mindfulness probably on a you know weekly basis, or whether it be on the train or or um, sometimes I'll do it with the kids. Um, but yeah, look, primarily it's, it's the social connections and activity for me. Yeah. All of this, you know, we've been talking about how mental health is interlinked with physical and financial health for our clients and how there's these five ways to well-being and 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 it's it's such a buzzword right now right well-being so all of these typically larger institutions are rolling out things like well-being platforms well-being programs what do you think is I mean? Do you think it's it's a good proposition? Do you think it change it, it contributes to the change of, of tone and conversation around mental health as a standalone type issue? How do you feel about those well being type programs? Um, and I think there's some really useful tools out there that users can get a lot of value out of them. But you know, traditionally we don't see huge uptake in a lot of those programs. Um, so one thing we're thinking about at Tal is is you know not only individual. Uh, prevention programs, but what else? What can we do for workplaces? You know, because I don't care how much mindfulness or activity uh, or social connections an individual has, if they're going into a toxic workplace, you know, that's going to have a, a massive impact on their mental state. Yes, I think there's absolutely a place, and we still need and we need to push for those wellness programs. But I think we need to look at the broader context of things as well uh, in in their workplace, in their in their home, and and relationships play a huge role in that. But yeah, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I think it's, yes, I support them. I believe in them 100%, but we need to think about the bigger picture of, you know, the environments that people are in. You know, it's, uh, if I think about a person that's on claim at the moment, you know, they might be on claim for a mental health condition and they, they've got a child at home with a disability or they, um, they're going through a marriage breakdown, you know. That's going, to, that's going to be really hard, really hard for that person. Uh, and, you know, you would, on the outset, you'd think, oh, okay, we just need to try and get them back to work. That's, that's probably the last thing on their mind is getting back to work. 
you know. So I, I think we part of that is meeting meeting people w- where they're at. Yeah, I think that's a really important part for not only an insurer but for advisors too um, to be thinking. You know, understanding what's happening for an individual uh, at a at a certain point in time, and being able to to sit in the uncomfortable, which is really hard for a lot of people. We we often want to try and fix. Whereas I think it's important to be able to sit in the uncomfortable and just listen. And, you know, I, I think there's a, as going back to your question, the wellness programs are useful when they're needed. And, but yeah, it's about finding the right time to get to people with those. So I really like that point you made earlier, Glenn, about meeting people where they're at. So I think that when a client, you know, has to call the advisor's office, tell them that they, they may need to make a claim, you know, claims are, for many advisors, the the critical junction of of creating and providing meaningful client support. So where do you think the opportunities are for advisors to really, you know, speak with clients, talk to clients and help clients along their their journey there? Yeah. Straight away when you say when the client calls and they say they want to make a claim, I similar to what I said earlier about we want to fix things. We want to oh, okay, let me get that rolling for you. I'll do this, I'll do that, and I'll reach out to the insurer. And they might have just disclosed to the advisor you know, um, I've just been diagnosed with cancer. They might have just disclosed that, you know, they've uh, been diagnosed with depression and uh, and they can't work, whatever it might be. I think there's an element of the being able to sit with that for a moment because they're a person first. And I, and I think the value of an advisor, if that, at that point in time, wow, that sounds really tough. How are you coping with that? You know, something like straight off the bat, Instead of oh, let me get these claims forms sorted, we'll get this rolling. Yeah, that's a great service as well. But I think there's we've got to we've got to be person centred first rather than service centred first. And and that's something you know I, I think is really important that we want great customer service absolutely, um, but they're a person first. And and I think we've got to treat them as a person first. So that's probably where I start. Um, and then it's about you know linking in with. Uh, for an advisor, linking in with what what resources are at the at the person's fingertips, uh, or at the advisor's fingertips to to support the individual. I'm I'm thinking out loud at the moment. Uh, for an advisor, let's say a person comes on claim for uh, a mental health condition, and for example, if they're a telecustomer, we then refer them through to mental health assist, uh, which is a program that we we provide to to our customers that are on claim for a mental health condition. Now that's it's not mandatory. It's it's purely voluntary. But the what mental health assist provides for us is an assessment with a psychiatrist within nine days, uh, a virtual assessment within nine days to see a psychiatrist. That's unheard of in out there in the sector. Um, you know, if I was just to go to the GP uh, and then get referred to a psychologist and potentially to a psycho- uh, psychiatrist, you know, the waiting uh, periods, you know, to see someone anywhere from six to twelve months before you actually get in front of you know a psychiatrist. Now, not saying that everyone needs a psychiatrist, but for those that are that are um, uh, uncertain about their diagnosis from their GP, uh, want the extra support, want a second opinion, um, the advisor being able to connect them in with that, um, I think is a huge value add. It's not just oh, okay, that's part of the process and hand it over to the insurer. I think that's a that's a um, it's becoming an ally in in the person's uh, recovery, and and I think that can go a long way you know when i think about a person on claim what you know you're you're not in the workplace so you don't you've you remove those those connections it's a hard thing to talk about to in your social groups or at you know your kids basketball games or whatever oh, i'm on claim for a mental health condition you don't do that so you're not really talking about it to anyone and so all of a sudden a person on claim can become really isolated very quickly and and we know the impacts of isolation on a person's mental state. And so if they feel as though that they've got an ally in their advisor to, to not only have the open conversation with them, but also um, get them connected and be proactive in supporting them with some offerings that an insurer might have in Tell's case of mental health assist, like I said, you know, they uh, to me, that's just a great support and goes almost above and beyond the role of an advisor and and to me again in my uh non-advisor mind i'm thinking that's got to be a good business proposition to to an advisor that you know they're doing they're going over and above for a client and that's 
that's you know building trust, respect, uh, and longevity um, with that relationship in my mind. Absolutely, I've always I've always very much been of the opinion that financial advice and more in a biased way because I I, I was a specialist risk advisor. Risk advice for me is one of the most people-centered professions you can possibly be in. We know so much uh, sensitive, intimate information about our clients. And I just I just really want to explore that that point that you made about, you know, when a client calls up to make a claim, and in many cases, the first thing we do is right. Uh, let me get those claim forms for you. I'll call and get a pre-assessment just to make sure. Have you got your histology? Have you got the the results? Let me get that pre-assessed for you, which is great. And that's a standard, right? That's that's what that's mm. what we get paid for. That's what we do. But I just I love the fact that you've really brought it back to make it even more people centered and just sit with your client and sit with that for a moment. It doesn't have to be over the top. You know, the touchy feely, but just like, oh my goodness, that that's I'm really sorry to hear that. Are you okay? Yeah. I think it's I think that's an absolutely vital point. And I think that, you know, a lot of I wouldn't necessarily say a lot of us, but I know myself, especially when I was starting out, like I didn't know what to do with that sort of um yeah. overwhelming information. So I would be the one who'd be like, Oh my goodness, that's oh, that's horrible. Hey, don't panic. We're gonna get the claim form sorted, it's all gonna be good. We'll do what we can. That's what we're here for. But just to sit with that, I think that in itself is a value add, let alone all yeah. of the other propositions that are available. Absolutely, yeah, because, you know, the um, we all want to be heard. And then when we, we get to a point where we're on claim or we're, we've been diagnosed with physical or mental health condition, it's tricky, it's tough, and, and it's hard to talk about. And if all of us, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's – if we're just able to – for a person with a cancer diagnosis, as I mentioned before, wow, that must be tough. How are you coping? Have you had conversations with the kids about it? What about your wife, your partner? Um, how are they coping? You know, all of a sudden, it's it's just saying, you know, we'll get that stuff sorted later. Let's focus on you as a person first. I just think that's it's so important and and be, can be so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's that's an incredible point for advisors and financial advice professionals to consider. So. Look, we're going to round out the podcast with, uh, I'm going to call it Glenn's three top tips. I'm putting you on the spot for three top tips. So if you could share three tips with advice professionals about how to look after their mental health, their clients' mental health, anything to do with mental health for three top tips, what what have you got for us? Okay, tip number one, I mentioned the five ways to wellbeing before. Every advisor, in my mind, should be reflecting on their own five ways to well-being and how they're going in those spaces in those domains um just google it five ways to well-being uh, you know and i think you you can come you can see what they are and um to me every advisor should be working towards that the second tip that i'd say ask more questions about a person's welfare and, and i think you know something like a, a simple how you're coping you know i think how you're going can is in australia it's, it's kind of dismissed to is it yeah i'm all right i'm all right uh, because it's used so often. Whereas if we, you know, how are you coping with everything at the moment? How, how's life, you know, with with everything that's going on? If your the advisor not, happens to know stuff about what's happening with kids going to school or with um, stuff that the wife might be going through or the, or the husband, ask more questions and, and ask how you're coping. And I think, you know, the third one, I'm going to say it's an extension of number two. Maybe that this is, maybe this is 2A, I'm not sure. Um, but it's like a, ask scaling questions. On a scale of one to ten, Sasha, how are you going at the moment, or how, how you how you travelling at the moment? You know, where ten's great and and one's not so great. How you travelling? Because all of a sudden, it, it, to me, that just changes the relationship with with people. Um, because if they say, "Oh, look, seven out of ten, you know, you know, things are, are going pretty good," but if all of a sudden my client comes back and says, "Oh, probably a four out of 10, maybe that just needs to be a trigger for. I know that there's an insurance policy in place. I wonder if the insurer has got some things that might be support might be able to support the person because right now they've just told me they're a four out of ten, and normally they're about seven or an eight out of ten. So what else can I do to support? And then um, an extension of that one, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm cheating. I'm cheating on your uh, on your questions here. Is don't forget about the services that are available out there in the public. You know, the Black Dog Institute has got some great services. Uh, Beyond Blue has got some great resources. Say in Australia, Men's Line, 
Um, you know, uh, there's so many services out there that are, that are free um, that are under underutilized. There's no doubt about it. So uh, I think leveraging some of those can be really useful as well. Fantastic. I really like that tip about the scale because, you know, basic psychology principles, yes and no answers give you nothing to work with. Oh, how you going, mate? Yeah, it's all good. You know, it doesn't give you anything to work with. And like you said, Australians are very much she'll be right type attitude. Um, no, I really like that scale because it does give you much more context to work with as an advisor and it's such a simple question. So, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. I'm sure you've given our listeners lots to think about, lots to work with, and that there, you know, there are lots of opportunities to address what can be a, a very sort of confronting space. So thank you very much for joining us today. No worries, Tasha. And if our listeners uh, wish to connect with you, they can find you on LinkedIn, I'm guessing? Yes, they can. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining and I'm sure we will speak with you again. Thanks for having me. See you later.